For Crema Media's Polity, I'm Shannon DeRayhove. I'm with the ISS's Gareth Newham to discuss the challenges facing the SAPS. You state that government is in denial about police brutality in South Africa. What has caused this problem of denial generally and in the police service specifically? Well, the reason why I say I think there's a denial about the problem is because when these incidents happen, it's always referred to as a few rotten apples. It's just a small handful of police. Uh, the Minister of Police, the spokesperson, said it was a minute number of police officials. And they talk about it as if it's just really a couple of bad cops that have just been caught out doing something wrong at that moment. When what we know is that this is far more a systemic problem that has been going on for some time. In fact, it never really stopped. Its roots go way into the apartheid policing. Um, there were large improvements in the first decade or so of, of the new South African police service after democracy. But even then, we had, if people think back, there was a case of the flying squad who set their dogs on Mozambican foreign nationals who were in the country legally. Um, there was another case of uh, the flying squad putting a live cigarette out in a, a seriously wounded hijacker. And these things became big media stories at the time and then they dissipated and people sort of went on with their lives. But if you look at the information coming from the Independent Complaints Directorate, which is now the Independent Police Investigative Directorate, IPID, uh, you know, two to three thousand criminal cases, mostly of assault, attempted murder against police officials every year. Um, our own research shows that um, when we could identify from focus groups in KwaZulu-Natal, Gauteng and the Western Cape, across different communities, informal settlements, suburbs, townships, inner city areas and peri-urban areas, about one in 50 people who had experienced a serious police abuse had tried to report it. So we know that it's a much bigger problem and a much more systemic and widespread problem than the way it's being portrayed and recognized as the police leadership at the moment. You mentioned that one of former National Commissioner Jackie Salibi's strategic mistakes was to push for a mass recruitment drive of police officers. Why was this such a dangerous mistake? Well, it seemed like a good idea at the time and it was not simply something that came out of thin air on Jackie Salibi's. Part. It was that he was appointed at the beginning of 2000 um, and at that stage crime had been increasing since 1996 so for the previous four years every year the crime stats had come out there had been an increase and quite big increases in some crime categories um, robberies and assaults and burglaries and so the fear of crime was growing people were getting more angry and concerned uh, and a lot of more pressure was being put on the police and the government to deal with this problem. Now, Jackie Salibi wasn't a police official. He had some management experience as the Director General of Foreign Affairs, and he had proven his ability to get consensus around banning landmines. So there was reason, good reason at the time why he was appointed, and most people thought, well, he, possibly he can do the job. Uh, but he didn't understand policing, and he didn't make it his business to learn much about policing, to really get into picking up books, going on courses. He was just parachuted into the organization, and when people said, well, we don't see enough police, they're not visible enough, there's a high crime, crime's going up, we call the police, they don't come. So the obvious solution seemed, well, let's just recruit more police officials. And so that was presented to the cabinet agreed, went to the treasury, and we saw this um, annual increase of about 14% per annum for 10 years in the, in the criminal justice system budget, most of which, just under 70% of that went to the police. So it was a very real increase, much way above the inflation rates. And that money was used to hire, in a, over a 10-year period from 2002 to 2012, almost 70,000 new additional police officials. Now, had there been some circumspect about this, some st taking a step back and thinking about it, and saying, well, what happens in other countries, they would have very quickly picked up that your systems have to be strengthened at the same time. If you're going to hire lots of people into a policing organization, um, give them firearms and put them out in the streets and put them under very difficult conditions. You can make sure, first of all, you get the right people uh, able to do the job. They have the training and the mental attitude. And you have to put systems in place to ensure that. The systems weren't strengthened enough to deal with this large influx of people. So, for instance, vetting wasn't always done correctly so that they could make sure that each person that was applying um, didn't have a criminal record, that their matric certificate was valid, that their driver's license was valid, for, for instance. Um, but they also then had to shorten the training process because they want to get these cops onto the streets. So they shortened the training uh, time from two years to one year. So you 
and then you've got bigger classes. So you're not sure that every police official is getting the right training. You're not assessing them to make sure they're understanding the work that they need to do. And then you put them into police stations. And so a supervisor who is managing 10 people this year, two years later is managing 30 or 40 people. And the internal systems for providing support to managers and for ensuring internal accountability were weakening at the same time. So you had this mass influx year on year of pushing people through many of them who shouldn't be police officials, weren't being properly trained and aren't being properly managed, at a time when Jackie Slebe, for instance, was making bad appointments at the top of the organization. And a very notorious example was where he appointed a new commissioner, or a new, uh, yeah, it was a new commissioner in charge of the Internal Nationals Inspectorate. That structure is a very important internal structure of the South African Police Service because it ensures that every one of the 1,116 police stations should be inspected many times each year, announced inspections and unannounced inspections. And they go to each police station to make sure that the rules and regulations are being upheld, name tags are on, um, that con confiscated firearms and contraband are being properly looked after and accounted for. They go through the whole police station, it takes about a week, and then they f have run reports. And that keeps people on their toes. And then the system must make sure that if there's a problem, it gets addressed and followed up on. And if it doesn't get followed up on and isn't addressed, then you start taking action, disciplinary action against the commanders or the people responsible. That system collapsed because the person that Jackie Slebi appointed that post had been found not to be fit to hold public office after Public Service Commission investigation and misconduct. So Jackie Slebi knowingly appointed someone who had been found to have been guilty of gross maladministration and was found not to be fit to hold public office as the head of this internal accountability structure. He was a political appointee. He was connected to um, upper echelons of the ruling faction of the ANC at the time. He was close to Tabo Mbeki and they thought, well, they'll just give him the job because he needs a job because he had been fired from his previous job. So without thinking what that would mean for the internal accountability structure. So it didn't take long for the National Inspector to collapse and some stations went for years without being inspected. So then you had stations breaking down, command and control breaking down. You had problems with legal services in the police. You had problems with the disciplinary system in the police. One, still today, one third of all disciplinary hearings, so a disciplinary hearing is only held when an allegation of misconduct has been made and has been investigated and evidence has been collected and the docket goes to a, a person in the legal services of the police and they look at the evidence and they say, right, this, there's evidence, prima facie evidence that this person has committed misconduct they then set up a, a disciplinary hearing. They have to appoint a presiding officer, a prosecuting officer. They have to give notice to the, to the accused. That person has to get representation. They have to book rooms, make sure they get recording equipment. After they do all that, the most likely outcome is that the case will be withdrawn or you'll be acquitted. Now that shows a serious weakness in the disciplinary system of the South African Police Service. Uh, and that, for instance, is one of the problems that hasn't been addressed and would be on the top of a plan to fix police brutality at station level. What other strategic blunders occurred and how has this impacted on the SAPS today? Well, one of the most notable strategic failures was that to shut down one of the four administrative tiers of the South African Police Service. So there's the national head office that sets policy. There's the provincial head office, which is supposed to run the policing in a province. And then there used to be what is called an area office. And an area office would oversee about 20 to 30 police stations. Um, and that is where a lot of the specialized units were, were located at area office. So the family violence, child protection, and sexual offenses unit, which dealt with child abuse victims, rape victims, was, was established at that area unit. Because there weren't enough police officials trained in those specialist skills, for instance, murder and robbery uh, units, internal anti-corruption units. Um, their public order policing units. There weren't enough people in those specialized schools to be located at each police station. So in order to have a unit so that they could share ideas, share professional ethos, and to provide a space for mentoring new people to come in, to give them the proper kind of experience and exposure they needed to do that kind of work, they were at the area level. And Jackie Slavery thought, well, since most crimes are reported to police stations, and it's true, most crimes are, um, we should have all those resources at police stations because then we'll build the resource base of police stations. So there's a logic to it and it sounds like it makes sense. Uh, unfortunately, however, if you take a group of specialist um, detectives who are working together and helping each other solve cases and you put one in that station, one in the station, one in the station, first of all, there weren't enough to go around. And the second thing is that um, those individual detectives started being used for other purposes. 
they weren't they didn't have the same kind of support network they needed they started losing contact with other service providers people outside the police that they might have been working with um, and so studies done in 2008 and 2009 show that that decision to to decentralize and get rid of specialized units set the police back badly in these in dealing with these crimes and we saw it from studies into the attrition rate of police cases dealing with rape the specialized units were, f were twice as effective as general detectives in dealing with cases of rape the murder uh, and robbery squads the specialized rob robbery units also, also dissolved robbery went up between 2006 and 2009 of houses house robbery went up 100 percent and business robbery went up 295 percent after those units were disbanded and of course public order policing was also disbanded and we saw from 2008 2009 large increase in public protests and then of course the recent Americana tragedy um, which demonstrates that the capacity that you need the specialist capacity to know how to bring the right resources and the right planning to bear on specific specialized policing challenges had been denuded in the South African Police Service because of that strategic mistake made by Jackie Salevi. How does the National Development Plan propose to overcome these significant challenges? Well this is the, the positive aspect of the plan is that it has a whole section on community and uh, public safety and it recognizes in part of the plan that the police have a problem. And so it's very, very good that the cabinet have adopted this plan. It's very good that the African National Congress has, has adopted the plan um, in, in December in Mangaung. And now we just hopefully they implement it. The, that plan has done the same diagnosis that many of us who follow policing in South Africa for many years have done and recognize the leadership failures and weaknesses. That the problems at the bottom of the organization are because of severe weaknesses and leadership failures at the top of the organization. The leadership at the top are not solving the problem. They don't have a plan and they don't know how to respond to the problem. So the National Development Plan says that a multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral national policing board must be established. You need to bring people into that board who are able to identify what are the skills, traits, qualifications and experiences that a national commissioner, deputy national commissioners, provincial national commissioners, divisional commissioners, all, this, all the different senior positions and positions in the police need to do their jobs effectively. And that must be agreed upon. And a lot of work has already been done that way. So it's not that we have to start from scratch. It wouldn't take long just to tweak it and to add a few kind of dimensions to that. And then to assess all the managers and starting at the top, is the person who's the head of the National Inspectorate, is the person in charge of the Crime Div Intelligence Division, is the person in charge of supply chain management, visible policing, detectives, you name it, is that person the right person for that job? Do they have the necessary skills, experience, qualifications and attitude to, to understand the problems they're dealing with and fix the problems? And then do an assessment of all those people and those that do have the skills and qualifications and there are people at the national level who do, can retain their positions and those that don't must be removed to another position where they don't have that authority and responsibility and open that position to a competitive application process. So it's not ministers in closed rooms appointing the divisional head of crime intelligence who just happens to be willing to abuse their powers in the interest of the political elite. It must be this person has been in the crime intelligence division for the last 25 years, has worked their way up, has worked in different kind of environments and understands the nature of crime intelligence and the challenges it faces because they've been in it and they know how to fix the problems and that's why we're going to put that person in charge of the division of crime intelligence at the top and their mandate is to improve crime intelligence, make the working conditions for the officers better and make sure that the products that crime intelligence provides to detectives, to visible policing are useful and are usable and are of high quality so that policing can be strengthened in, 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 in line with international best practice around intelligence driven policing. That's not happening. People are being appointed there for reasons that have got nothing to do with their skills, qualifications. It's got more to do with their political and personal loyalties to other senior officers. And that's hugely problematic. It's not all people, but under Becky Tsele and under Jackie Slebi, there were lots of people who were appointed who are still there and they need to be assessed because they are not solving the problems that the police are experiencing. And that's putting the lives of police officials at risk and it's putting the lives of South African citizens at risk. Why do you think the government is so reluctant to actually begin the process of what needs to be done? I think because they don't get political support for it. Because if the president called his security cluster and said, right, we've got to sort out policing. We must fight corruption and violent crime. 
and I want to make sure that in the next year I have a I can report back to the people of this country what you've done to improve policing, its credibility, how you deal with corruption, on a clear plan with measurable objectives. Um, and next month I want you to present that plan to me and I will make sure and I will make sure that this plan gets implemented. It would happen. That's how countries work. That was Gareth Newham of the ISS discussing the challenges facing the SAPS.